I think that that's part of the problem with suicide because, well, we tell people to talk about it, for one thing, but nobody's modeling how. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we don't know how to talk about it, how can we get young people talking about it? It's, it's fine and good to say, you know, if you have mental illness, talk about it. If you're hurting, talk about it. But we don't give them words to do it. And they don't see anyone else doing it, yeah. which communicates that this is not something that's safe to do. But it's all so morally benign. We don't know why we can't talk about it. Yeah. And if we don't, as the article quoted me, if we don't talk about it, it'll get the better of us. Yeah. And it's not about painting a drama out of it. Because drama, when we don't talk about it, and there's secrecy, and people are left with their own thoughts in their own heads, in the hell of their own little universe, romancing suicide, convincing themselves that the lies that they're telling themselves are the truth, if we don't let these things out, if we don't have that dialogue, um, there's really only one direction that that kind of thing can go just down and down and down. One of the things that I really liked about your talk was that example of instead of like curling in on yourself yeah. is to like open up because um, I was seeing like a therapist like for, you know, just uh, like emotional things and he uh, gave me homework to do and one of the things was when I was in one of those depressive states was I had to call somebody and I had to talk only five minutes about myself and then I had to ask them how they were doing and to like involve myself in their life like or not just always be self looking and inward and then I was to rate how I felt before that phone call like on 10 or whatever and then how I felt after that phone call and then consistently I had to do that every day or whatever and uh, consistently I could see the score difference from before I made the phone call to afterwards so then it became like a truth because before that it's a lie that you tell yourself that I don't feel like it or it's not going to be helpful or whatever. So, that's yeah. good. You have to force yourself at first to do it. And then when you see the benefits. And by having it in a journal and seeing it on paper, you can't, you can't ignore that. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. That's almost part of the problem, isn't it? That it's that doing something. That's that, how do you get people to make that leap when they're in a very difficult, dark place? It can be the doing of anything that can be your first step out. How to make that leap. I had to be forced to do it. Forced, yeah. And be told that every day I had to at least contact one one of my friends, sometimes two, and I had to go out and meet with friends. I couldn't, not just the phone calls, but like, so once a week I had to meet with friends. Once a day I had to call somebody that I cared about. And I always had to rate those experiences in journal until it became more natural to do that. Because it's not natural when you're in that state. Yeah. It yeah. is a very lonely, closed-in place, and you almost don't want to burden other people with your problems. Mm -hmm. But that's also good. Why the you know the therapist said just talk about yourself for five minutes, and then focus on them and yeah. what they have to say. That whole burdening other people with your problems—that's another big problem, isn't it? People don't want to be a negative presence in people's lives. People don't want to suck the happiness out of the people around them. People don't want to drag other people down so they keep it to themselves out of what? Desire to protect. Love for the people that they don't want to drag down with them. But, I, and somewhere in my talk I, I, I said that um, let go of all the crap that doesn't matter. Let go of everything that makes life worse. And I sat thinking, Looking at that line, everything makes life worse because that sounds so much like that message if someone's bringing negativity into your life, dump them and stuff. It looks like that, but it's not the same thing. Because cutting people out of your life who have mental illness, who are suffering or whatever, cutting them out does not make life better. It makes life simpler, and that's not better. But when you, when somebody trusts you and brings their suffering to you, Helping to heal that suffering becomes helping to heal yourself as well because you feel their pain and the healing of it begins then the healing of your pain. And these things all make life better. The connectedness that we have through sharing our sufferings with each other makes life better. So I wouldn't want that one line to get misinterpreted in the same way that we say to people, just dump people who are... I find that... I, did, did people notice those things? There were so many messages going around. 
I don't need, it, you know, people drag you down, dump them, you don't need them, walk away from that stuff. And then there's the suicides. And then the message switches. Talk about it, share. So we, have, we all have responsibilities about accepting that responsibility, which is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Because we all connect it. You know, if somebody is, people talk about the day that they plan to commit suicide, they go out or something to the store or whatever, and then somebody smiles at them. And that saved their life. That's how little it takes. How very little it takes to save lives. But it also takes a lot because it's got to be every opportunity that you have. Every encounter. And there's so much fear. I'm walking down the street, preparing this presentation. I'm walking down the street and I see someone walk by and I think, you know what, I should smile as they walk by. But at the last second, you kind of chicken out. Look down, you know? It is hard. And there's fear. There's, I don't know why. It's so easy to smile. So I think that we actually live with a great deal of fear and a great lack of courage. And this is not about blame at all, but about facing, about facing what we do, what we can do, how we can help, how little it takes to help, and how much it takes to make life good. I think it's difficult too to try to help um, because sometimes it's enabling the person to continue yep. Yep. Um, to be that way. Well see that's the not smothering, not coddling, not battling your emotions, and, and certainly not reinforcing the hell of somebody's own universe. You don't want to reinforce. That's, that's a very tricky thing. Is there, I, went, I went to therapy, I, I had therapists, and that through that process, there's a time and a place for everything. There's no criticism here. But that selfish state of suffering was almost reinforced. I started to coddle it through that process, going deeper and deeper into my Because you can't change it. You can't go back. You can't make painful memories into happy ones. You can't erase it all. There's nothing you can do. So going deeper and deeper and deeper into it, I, I it just solidifying that sense that myself, myself, and my suffering, that center stage. There's a time and a place, because I think what therapy ultimately is intended to do is to help people see the truth that's going on inside of them, which we do need to do. Yeah. But then you need to... But you're not coddling, not coddling. Yes, and it need, you need to be brought out of yourself, drawn out of yourself, one way or another. And loving it, I mean, it could be an animal, you're a dog, anyone, but taking it out of yourself. Heels, heels. Yeah. That reminds me of a book that my granddaughter was sitting right here <laughs> led to me, a street cat named Mom. And that's how he was saved from his, oh. his spiral down was to a cat that was injured and needed him. He had nothing, but somehow we found what he needed to do to, to bring him into the cat, and that saved him. Yeah, suicide is such a taboo subject, isn't it? But you're right that you need to take it out of the closet and make it an okay topic to talk about. Um, that's why I wanted to bring my kids here today was because I want them from a young age to feel like it's okay to talk yeah, about yeah. that type of thing because it's in discussing and sharing it that uh, healing happens and, yep. and demystify it and yep. de dethrone it or take it off of a pedestal. Yep. And I like the analogy that you may have made, you know, about driving over the people as you go off the cliff. Because of course, like, you know, I've had suicidal thoughts and, you know, it's, if my family are in the way, no way, of course, obviously, right? But that's exactly what you're doing to them, I think, right? Yeah, I take this focus off of I think one of the greatest gifts that you can give and the most help you can give is, um, you know, sometimes we, we don't go to that person because we don't know what to say, we don't know what to do. Um, for me, it was the gift of, I want to be with you. <laughs> and it came from Francine. And in, in those dark moments, you just have such uh, self loathing But if that person keeps coming to you time and time again, for it doesn't matter how long, like for me, it was long periods of depression. And yet she was always there and didn't have to say much. It was just the gift of her presence. And that was so healing. And, you know, 
being through that together has, has really strengthened our friendship. That's right, it's a gift both ways. Mm -hmm. So if we've been held that way, it's our responsibility um, to go to those that we see are struggling with hurting. Um, no matter how uncomfortable that may be, um, just the going is so important, and I think we have that responsibility. It's kind of like when I talk about bullying and what it takes to stop bullying, which is anything, anything, do anything, whatever you can think of, do. If you see somebody being cruel, treating somebody else cruelly and unkindly, do whatever you come up with is enough to throw it off. Do something. Because you think, what's the right thing to do? What? I don't know. Think of something. Do anything. And I think it's the same with this. We don't know what the right thing to do or to say is. But do something. Do anything. And I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna tell this um, part of the story, but it relates directly with what you just said. And it was after that, seeing the mother in the funeral home parking lot after her son's funeral. And it was. It broke my heart. And it la it lasted a long time. And I was standing there, you know, gardening, and with all this life surrounding me, and then the the pain, the pain, and I didn't know what to do. You feel so helpless. What can you do to make that good? You can't. You can't go up to her and say things will get better. You can't go up and say, it's all right. You can't say anything that will touch what happened. But I I stood there it was probably an hour wondering what, what, with the helplessness and watching the scene. And uh, at the end, of it, I told myself, I had a grow sunflowers and uh, there was one big, beautiful sunflower. The first one that had grown to a big, beautiful sunflower. I looked at that and I thought, I want to give that to her. But I mean, I'm two fences away, and it's just a scene. I'm what, I don't have any right to intrude on that scene. I don't. But I stood there, and it was nagging and nagging and nagging and nagging at me. I really, I was going to tell the story. And then I told myself, well, you know what? I'll just wait. And if there's an opportunity, if it looks like there's an opportunity for me to go and do that, I'll do it. And I waited a long time, and then finally, just as I thought they were about to drive away. She was sitting in the car, and then her husband, uh, her partner, whoever was with her, got to the funeral home, and she was there alone in the car, and I thought, well, I told myself I would do it. So I ran, cut off the sunflower, jumped over the fences, ran up to her car, and uh, handed it to her. And her eyes were glazed, I don't know how. I handed it to her, and I ran off. Back over the fence, wondering if she was watching me, thinking it was this crazy person. <laughs> That's what you think. This, this could be like a crazy person, or, or even just having intruded on her mourning, having intruded in on her grief, or whatever. I, I didn't know what is the right thing to do. I don't know, but I didn't want to regret not doing it, so I did. And then I, I that, that that was um, it's been a while. And then just this morning, just this morning, and even yesterday, I was thinking, is it okay to even share that story? It's so personal. I wasn't even sure, but it's to touch, this is the reality of it. Uh, but I was still, even yesterday, uncertain and afraid of sharing that. And then this morning, um, Sharon had been out last night with some friends and talking about the suicide talk, and then Sharon mentioned that story with the sunflower. And her friend said, oh, that was Kelvin. Apparently she works with this woman. And the woman had gone back to work eventually and had told people about this. After the funeral, some person <laughs> came and handed her a sunflower. And it was her son's favorite flower. Oh, wow. And she said to her it was an angel who came to her. And that it rescued her that day, she said. It rescued her. And she doesn't say, but she doesn't know what I look like. She, she didn't see me right there. And anybody else who was there, she said, there were other people in the car. Nobody saw me. Nobody saw me. I just thought some angel appeared, brought her to the car. Yeah. And I thought, that's what I needed to hear this morning. And you might never hear, you might never know whether what you did was stupid or good or helpful or hurtful. You don't know. But do something. I don't know. Yeah, like, just keep doing it. And I just, I just wanted her to not be left with that scene. I didn't want her last thing at her son's funeral to be what I had witnessed for the past hour. Anything, distract her, take, give her something else that, that can be a memory associated with that. Well, 
But you can't touch this stuff. You can't heal the pain. You can't heal the But you can see it. You can acknowledge it. How many people who suffer and suffer and suffer, if someone just sees it, if you're not alone, you know, sometimes that's enough, is not being alone with your pain. There's not always a cure. There's not always a cure. And life doesn't always get better. It can get worse and worse and worse, and it can be torture. But it's possible to live with it. You don't have to live alone with it. There are treatments for it. And where there isn't, you can recognize the lies. And, you know, my mother has written a book, um, Suffering Eyes, a Chronicle of Awakening. And it's about awakening to the suffering of animals at the hands of humans. And going into that book, she thought, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can go into it. There's too much pain. I can't. I don't know. Can I take even more pain? But you can. That's the thing. That's what she learned in that book. You can always, you can always take more pain. But you know what came? The step came when I thought, but I don't care if I can oh, yes. or not. Yeah, that's right. That's what it took. I don't care. Because the pain of where I was staying was so great. Yeah. And I don't care. I So isn't that, and I hear people say that all the time. There was this one student at a school, I was meeting with the students, and one of them was saying, oh, she'd been bullied from grade seven to grade nine or 10, all those years being bullied. And I said, oh, and she says, but not anymore. I said, oh, so the bullying stopped? She goes, no, I'm a senior now, now I, I, I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and people wonder why I wear this shirt. People don't like this shirt, but everywhere you go, what frees people is that I don't care. I don't care. And you have to because you can't do anything about it. You can't fix your memories. You can't fix the things that have gone wrong. You can work to make things better from here forward. Always you can work. But you have to let go. And then you're free. And then you can care about that. Yes, exactly. Because caring about all the rest is your energy. And your attention going into all of these things that can't be repaired, can't be solved, can't be fixed, can't be healed. And then that smothers out. There's no more room left to care about what actually does matter. Which is that you love your loved one. And that's why I, it's very hard for me to ask that question. Can we really call our relationships with each other love? Because everywhere I go I see people are loving. I see love all over the place. But in my story, I can't help but see that all of these good, loving people are capable of cutting somebody out, rejecting them, walking away and not thinking of them ever, ever again, not talking to them ever again. It's too, it would be too hard, it would hurt them too much to face the pain that has resulted from that. And it's good people who are capable of doing that. So where is that? It's like a, a dissonance, dissonance. Good people who's the love can stop. It can only go so far. And in our relationship with each other, spouses, things like that, how many times a day do we say something that maybe wasn't very kind or an annoyance? And you can feel it choking out. You know, if you really see that was unkind or that was, you know, not loving. A hundred times a day, you could be not loving to the person you love. So it is, we have to look very deep. And then what it takes to be loving takes everything you've got. So it's not about saying, and the idea that talking about asking that question, a mother has lost her child, for example, and to ask that question, can we call our relationships with each other love? As if that mother didn't love her child does not be an insinuation at all. Sometimes a mother can give their child all their love, and it can still not be enough. So it's not if somebody that you love has committed suicide, that's not to say that you didn't give them enough love. That the world is dry. And sometimes that, sometimes that's what, because um, we do, we go out into the world and people are unkind and people judge you and Everyone's got their own opinion about this and what you should be, what you should do with your life, all the pressures. And I think of Robin Williams. Well, what role did we play in his suicide? All of us consuming this person, the image of this person, this person that we expect to be funny, 
The person that if we ran into them in public, we would want, hey, I want a picture with you. As if they're an actor, an image, not a human being. You don't just walk up to a human being and say, I'm going to take your picture. You're not treating them like a human being. You're not seeing the person. You see that funny man who's famous. And you erase the person behind that image. I think he was probably completely consumed. I, I, I don't know, I saw somewhere, somebody, it was posted, the, the last picture, reputedly the last picture taken of him, it was in a diner, and uh, it's with a, a waitress, standing all happy, waitress sitting right next to our woman, so he just looked empty, skinny and empty, a little smile, but there's no smile there, but a little smile, and I think that was in his life, everywhere you go, you're just an image to people, you're just something, they go up and have the picture, they've got their little piece of you and walk off, and where's the connections? Where's the connectedness? Where's the meaning? Where's the love? So I think that all, all of us um, have, have some role. I mean, most of us, we don't know him too. That's the thing. We all feel his loss, but none of us knew him. None of us. So what are we grieving? Are we grieving someone we knew? Someone we loved? No. We were grieving somebody who made us laugh, that we felt connected to, but there was actually no connection. How lonely must somebody like that be? And the pressure to be that funny person, the pressure to be the image. I think the loss that uh, is also felt is probably like, well, look at this guy, he had everything. Like he had, you know, he was famous, he was still making movies, he you know, obviously was very wealthy, well off, he obviously seemed to have fun. Um, so if he can't handle it, yeah. you know, wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. But, the, the Robin Williams, for me, didn't surprise me at all. I saw that for a long time. I'm not surprised by that. But I think, and I, but I still feel sad by it, but I feel sad for his family. And again, people who, who look up to him are young yeah. actors. And it's not, it's very common that people who seem like they have it all together or who are funny are actually suffering. And it's very common that comedians are yes. victims yes. of suffering. And that's also part of why they're a comedian, because they're looking for love from strangers. Yes, so, that's true. Yep. And, and very common that actors are suffering very much, too. And that's part of, in the arts, too. It's very yeah, the arts. Yeah. But I, I have a question, though. Is So people who are suffering from suicide, is that, or wanting to commit suicide, is that, when you say mental illness, that pertains to mental illness, is it like a chemical thing, or is it because of ongoing suffering of, of struggling to let go? Yeah. What is, what is there a difference? Well, I make I make a distinction whenever I talk about my mental illness. Um, I make the distinction of the different types. So there's the biological, medical mental illness. Mm -hmm. Biological. Right. Uh, but but I. And I know that mental illness as a term, so people who will be mental health professionals will probably have a very, um, a very strict view of what can fall into the category of mental illness. It would have to be diagnosable, it would have to be, meet these criteria. Well, I speak more broadly about it okay. because I think that there is the, the medical mental illness and there is the mental illness that results from life and the lies that we tell ourselves and hiding and beating ourselves down and just distorting perception. See, I think that when I speak of mental illness broadly, I'm talking about that distortion of perception, so that you're not seeing clearly, you're not thinking clearly, you don't see clearly. And so, arguably, maybe all suicide comes out of mental illness in that sense. Would anybody who's mentally well and healthy commit suicide? I don't know, but I also don't rule that out. Because sometimes, for some people, life really does stop being worth living. And this is another piece of the whole suicide question. We think of suicide in terms of young people. Uh, but while I was sharing, she studied uh, psychology at McGill, and one of the statistics that I was most surprised by in her textbooks was that the biggest, the group with the highest rates of suicide are seniors. Yeah. We always talk about it in terms of our young people, our young people, but seniors are killing themselves in great numbers. And that's a whole different Scenario. See, I this is this. I, I don't. I think that our life is our own. My life is my own. Your life is your own. You don't have the right to my life. I don't have the right to yours. So, in some sense, I don't. I, I don't know if I can say to people that you have no right to kill yourself. There are times where I think for myself, 
If I were in that situation, I would at least want to reserve the right to do it, to choose how I will die if I'm facing a painful, incurable death, for example. It's not about saying that all suicide is bad. Maybe it is, I don't know. Because in the same breath, your life is connected to everybody. Everybody. So in a sense, your life isn't your own. But to think of telling somebody who's suffering terribly, 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 or at the end of their life, or alone, because it's that connectedness and love. Some people, by the end of their life, their friends have all died, they're fed, they may have no family. Maybe they're absolutely, utterly alone. Some people are. And when you're alone and without love, you don't want to live. Maybe they're at the end of their life. So I, I don't know. I don't know if I can say that you don't have the right to go your, on your terms. But I remember having this conversation once with my mom and saying, actually, like that. And she said, well, she said she thinks that for people who do check out, it's not, not her wording, but for people who do check out before they go, before it's time, for, before they die naturally, one way or another. They are robbing themselves of the full experience of life, all the way through. And dying is a part of the experience that you gain, that's part of life. And so if you, it was something along those lines, eh? So it's, there is still more to experience. And you're robbing yourself of that to go, even if it's going to be painful, even if it's going to be long. You rob yourself of something to skip it. Yeah. You rob other people of the opportunity to care for you. Yes. I mean, I don't think people are ever alone unless they are physically alone on the island or yep. something. Yep. There's always people yep. who are affected also by what you do, no matter what. Yep. What is the message of your life? What's the final That's message? Right. What gift can others now give to you? And definitely being control, you know, yep. focusing on, on working towards that kind of thing. Even if it's just the nurse who tends to, yeah. she would be affected. She, so everybody, that's why we are all connected. We think of it as just, well, maybe my mother and my father and my best friends or something, but anybody who knew you in any way, anybody who walks past, anybody who hears about it has been affected then. How many of the suicides here recently? I didn't know any of them personally, but I was affected. We were all affected. And that's what's so tragic. I mean, it becomes your last message. And that's the message that people remember. So it makes me angry. And I felt, you know, when I heard about the Robin Williams suicide, like you, I, I, I wasn't, I was surprised. But I wasn't, because I could see. It's always in his eyes. There's, in his oh, eyes, you see, you see the sadness. Mm -hmm. um, but then I felt the sadness of it. I felt the, this has been a long couple of weeks, having had this on my mind for two weeks. But I, then I became angry when I found out he killed himself. I was angry because I've heard these students, that students, two students at that school, this student at that school, people locally, trans people I knew. And then he goes and does it. I was angry. This, now on top of everything else. This on top. And then the sense of, well, if Robin Williams can't do it, then I, neither can I. And just, what? Talk about it. Take it out of the closet. But that anger is not anger at him. It is kind of I'm angry. You, the good message is all of his movies and dealing with these things, and there's a way through, and you can be strong enough, and you can survive. You don't need to die. And these are messages. And then, uh, and then he went and sent out the opposite, and it just stained everything. We'll all love him. We love him. We always will. But he has stained. And that is what you do. That's, see, that's that difference, romancing suicide. But what you actually do is stain everything you've ever done. Stained. Permanently. Part of the romancing of suicide is thinking that people will see the best in me. People will see, oh, what a tragedy. Oh, the pain that that person must have had. And they think that it'll, everything you've done. And that is a burden. That is a huge burden because we do work hard. We do work while we're here, while we can. We're trying to make life good. We're trying to send positive messages. But if you, at any point you give up, you've undone it. So you got to stick around. In order for anything you've ever done to stay good, you have to stick around. I have another question. Yeah. Um, so for people who are suffering, um, 
and with burdens of trauma or whatever the case may be. What is it about us or those who are suffering with thoughts of suicide of, of not letting go? Why, why are they so consumed and constantly feeding it and thinking about it and reliving stuff? Where is that coming from? Well, that's, I mean, it's, 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 um, it's neurotic. So if you have a toothache, you do something about it. Your tooth is hurting, you go to a dentist. You don't wait around, you don't sit and coddle that pain, you don't go and nurse it, you deal with it. You go and you get it fixed. And once it's fixed, you can remember that you had a toothache, but you're not reliving the toothache over and over and over. But emotional pains, we do. So it's neurotic. You're reliving a pain that is in the past. If you think of like the Lion King, where the, the monkey witch doctor guy goes and bucks the guy on the head and says, well, why'd you do that? He goes, it doesn't matter, it's in the past. <laughs> it's cute. I thought, I thought of that. And then, so it's, it's um, there's something that we're, and it's trying to fix, trying to relive, because we object to what happened. That's why we obsess, why we hold on, because we object to it. And we can't accept it. And so we keep reliving it, as if trying to relive another outcome, or another possibility, or something else I could have said, or something else I could have done, something that could have changed this, or, and that goes nowhere. Here's the interesting thing about that. I have spent so much time thinking about what happened, the most recent thing being that, well not the most recent, but the big thing being fired. So going every day, I can't let go. I can't let go of what happened, I can't let go of how it threw. Just rebuilding my life and having it all torn, torn out from under me again. And then, and all of what that meant to me, which is the hell of my own little universe. A person can fire somebody and go on with their life. It's my hell in which that, all of what that means, is just in my little universe. But, why can't I let go? Why can't I? And that's why for, for the past two years plus, I've said my next public presentation, is going to be on the subject of forgiveness. Because I knew I can't go forward. There's other things I want to talk about, but I knew I can't go forward until I get that one sorted out because I can't get past this. I can't get past what happened. And then realizing through that process, and then of course I end up giving this, this just needs to come first. Forgiveness can wait. This We need to talk about suicide. Forgiveness can wait. And I thought forgiveness was going to be hard, but if I could talk about this, well then forgiveness would be easy. <laughs> and it ties into so much of this, that dying, dying into it all. Um, but through that process, realizing that it wasn't unforgiveness that I was struggling with. I love all of them, and I always will. I, not, I haven't let go of anyone. So what is it that I'm suffering with? Which is grief. Grief. I'm grieving. And what to do with grief that won't go away. And then I was watching this documentary about a family, grandparents who had lost their daughter and their grandchild um, and their, uh, to a murder-suicide by their son-in-law. And it's a Canadian family, and um, at one point in the documentary they interviewed a grief counselor. And the grief counselor said, very simply, that grief is love's unwillingness to let go. And when I heard that, and when I realized that, that's exactly what it is. My grief is love's unwillingness to let go. I love them, but it's love interrupted. I can't just... And for parents who've lost, you know, you can't let go. And when I realized that I grieve because I love, then there's at least some good in it. I don't mind the grief because it's a reminder that I love. And a mother, for example, who's lost her child to suicide or something like that, maybe she will think, well, maybe in time I should be able to stop grieving. In time, people will tell you, oh, well, there's that process. You'll go through a process of grief and then, and then I don't know, maybe it'll, you'll go through it and out of it. But maybe you never will. But the, it's because Love is unwilling to let go. That you grieve? To me, that freed me from feeling like there was something wrong with me. It was the opposite. It reminds me that I'm healthy. They haven't taken away my ability to love. And so I grieve because of it. So I'm healthy. 
And then there was freedom in that. I grieve because I love, so I'm healthy. But it's strange too, like when you ask that question, it made me think of my own depression and there was almost some, um, I can't think of the word or how to explain it right, but there was almost some enjoyment in going over my own soul, the soul yes, 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 yes. and trying to think what that was all about. And I think that I had a chemical depression, so the imbalance. And, but while I was in that, I was using all of my past negative experiences and reliving them almost as a way of like justifying my depression. It was like, oh, well, I've had such bad things happening and then just dwelling on those. It was almost like justifying the sadness that I felt. And so it was, yeah. It was, and do you see how I don't enjoy it, but I did. Like, I did. Well, because it it's like as if there's got to be, well, there's got to be a reason. If, if I'm suffering like this, there's got to be a reason. So you start looking for those reasons and gathering and them up. And then dwelling on them. And that is not facing the truth of the fact of mental illness. Yeah. It's like you're trying to make up these reasons why you have it, but maybe it's fix it, treat it. Yeah. So many forms of mental illness are perfectly treatable conditions. And that's what makes such a tragedy out of so many of them. Because if they've just gotten this medication. I remember when I first started getting medicated, several people came up to me and said, oh, don't worry, there's not as much um, stigma as there used to be. And I was like, what are you talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not really heavy doses of antidepressants. I'm doing great. And people are always saying, oh, the stigma, the stigma. But now that I'm on the antidepressants, I see that stigma. Not that I've experienced it, but I've seen that there has been that stigma for it. And my neighbor was so miserable for so long, and I just kept telling him, like, you know, like it changed my life when I went on the medications. And then sure enough, he was stubborn for years, and sure enough, he went on the meds, and within a couple weeks, he's like, wow, like I'm living again. I'm actually looking, like I actually like, want to get out of bed in the morning, and I'm living, you know, like you're not living when you have this uh, imbalance in your hormones or brain. But meds are good, but there's still the other work as well. Oh, yes, like that's having a Exactly. And that's exactly right. Therapy came after the antidepressant yeah. medication that I had to then work through. Because it's this, you get into, uh, the longer you've been unmedicated in a depression, this is what I've experienced, is the harder it is to get your mind back to a non depressed person's mind and not always think, expecting the worst or thinking the worst or, or expecting the worst to another You've people. trained the brain. The brain is like a machine. You train it to see the bad, to see the negative. Look for well, it's always to how it's unfair to it. me. It's always unfair to me yes. when you think about instead about all the good or all the you know instead of just focusing on the bad. Yeah. And there was a, someone who taught uh, self hypnosis at the senior center, which is a little little couple of sessions thing. And one of the things that she talked about was how what the brain is used to it recognizes as familiar, the sort of subconscious. It recognizes as familiar and takes that in. Mm -hmm. It doesn't recognize say, the positive message. As familiar, it does not happen in. So that's that cycle that just keeps on so all you're getting. And so that idea of truth, speaking the truth, taking your will and speaking the truth, I guess that would be in a state where your mind could receive it at a subconscious level. And actually speaking those words of truth to yourself and then remaining and living in that truth, hold on to that one thing and live that out can begin to change those kind of messages, that kind of receptivity, those messages can then begin to shift. But it is a process that requires both the treatment for you know, medical condition and that kind of work that takes a shift. Yeah. I also want to point out like, really strongly like how people who have not suffered from depression and have not had that experience have no way of understanding what it's like at all. Because when I was a teenager, I was not depressed, and I had members of my family who were, and I just remember thinking, like, snap out of it, like, life is not bad, like, just, like, wake up, what's wrong with you? And then when I went into the depression, I was like, this is what it's like. It's just so, you know, uh, un uncomprehensible. Yeah. It really is. And it does change everything you see. Yeah. Everything changes. Yeah, um, like my wife, Sharon, is just happy. She would find it probably very hard understand depression or mental illness. Very hard. She's happy. She always defaults to happy. If she gets angry, all you need is play some music and then she defaults back and she's happy. <laughs> so, but she's, about once a month, she <laughs> discovers what it can be like for your perception to be altered by your body. 
and she can, she's in that state, she'll be like snappy, and, you know, and then she'll say, I can't, this must be what it's like for people who have mental illness. It must be like this, but all the time. I'm angry, everything's annoying me, everything's negative, I only see the negative in everything. And then the next day, oh, oh that's why, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. so we have to humble ourselves, realize that we are a product of our bodies as well. We do not have the power psychologically to just make everything good. Yeah. And I think a lot of people who go out there and talk about stuff, you know, or, or gurus or whatever, is as if, well, if you just reach this enlightenment, then you'll be free from this or that or whatever. And people can spend their lives trying to do or be something. But a little pill that fixes some chemistry can do what people spend a lifetime trying to do by becoming this or that or something. So I think that's one of the lies, that you can be just strong enough to not be mentally ill or whatever. And people beat themselves up. Why can't I do this? Why can't I be stronger? Why can't I, you know? And we, but some people, their bodies produce so much serotonin that they've just got no issues, no trouble. They can get through anything in life, bounce back from anything. Um, and then there's others who don't. And then it's a different struggle. But that's your body. And it's not, it's morally benign. Morally benign. So treat it. Deal with it. And then, also remember that even if you treat it, you may still have depression. Because maybe your life is still crappy, you know? So to not think that, well, I mean, I'm on the medication, but I'm still blah, blah, blah. You may have other work to do, well, which is to make life good. That's, yeah, that's really important to recognize is that there is the, the uh, you know, the chemical imbalance. But um, my old family physician kept trying to take me off of my antidepressants once I'd get in a good, stable position. And she said, well, let's start weaning you off. And then I'd go right back into depression and worse than the one before. Um, so my current family physician believes that you need to be on the antidepressants for a significant amount of time. Um, to get back into the habit of thinking positive, expecting positive, uh, living uh, positive before you come off the antidepressants, because otherwise, uh, you know, you can't just treat the physical and not the, the mind. Yeah. Or the That's thinking. right. Yep. Yep. Uh, so when you treat the physical, it gives you time to then treat yes. the way of thinking and change your habits. And thoughts do affect your body chemistry. Right. They really do. So it's not about just medicating. It's not about just trying to do everything on your own. There's such a balance. But what it requires is, A, face that I'm not thinking clearly, I'm not seeing clearly, and I don't have to be suffering this way. There are alternatives, medically, and in your thoughts, and in your life, and what it is that you hold on to, and what you're prepared to let go of or die to. So there's so much that can be done. But all of that just demands just facing it. We can spend so much of our lives just trying to nurse ourselves along, you know? You see so many people and young people and they go through and they're living miserably and they just, you know, whatever it is, drinking or drugs or whatever and just sort of ignore it. And just almost sleeping through adolescence, sleeping through adulthood, sleeping through life. Some people just... But just uh, face it. Go with it, deal with it. And um, I think just not facing it, you've already made the step, the step that it takes to make things better, which is facing. And then what that'll look like uh, will look different for everybody. It, it will look different. Um, but I don't think when someone commits suicide, I, I don't think they're thinking of being selfish. I don't know. Like, but my when I had this question with my grandmother and I told her what had happened, her first thing was, oh, that's so selfish. And I hate, I really bothers me when people say that because when you're in that state, I don't think there's nothing rational really about what you're doing, right? But I hear that a lot and I don't really know what to say to people when they say that, but it upsets me when they yeah. say that. I believe that's true, though, because when I was in my worst, when I was thinking of suicide and that sort of thing, I remember, I think it was called my mom or something, said about thinking about how it would affect other people, mm -hmm. and that's what brought me out of it, was I realized that I wasn't thinking about other people, I was only thinking of my own pain and suffering, and if I was not thinking of other people and how it would affect them. And that helped me get out of that really, really dark time. It wasn't what would bring me all the way out and make me like live happy after that. But I did realize that I was, because when you're in that the state that you're so far gone that you are ready to kill yourself, you don't love yourself. 
but it doesn't mean that you don't love the people that are around you, your family and your parents and whatever. And so when you realize that you are just being so self-focused that you, you can't see how this might affect other people, it was enough to bring me out, although I don't like maybe the term being pointed yeah, out as being like the first reaction. But it is completely selfish though, right? Well, it is, it's but such I just don't like that term. No, so I know. It's a very judgmental term. Yeah. And that's my idea that you're not able at that point to be thinking of others. It's yeah. a different way to put Because you're sick and yeah. you're suffering. Yeah. You're not there. But right. that's what, I, I bother when people say that. And I know they're blaming. How else well, but they're also trying to find... Okay. Justify it? I remember when I was in high school, I remember the subject of suicide coming up and the teacher saying, oh, suicide is the most selfish thing a person yeah. can do. And that did not feel right to me That's at exactly all. What? It didn't feel right. And I said the exact same thing. For me, if I'm suffering and I want it to, to, to make me live with the suffering is the most selfish thing you could do. That's the way I thought about it. And over the years, that has expanded. I still feel that way about that kind of statement. But it has expanded because now I see, and I'm a parent, and I can see through my mother's eyes now, if I had committed suicide, it would have been the most selfish thing I could have done. It would have been the most selfish thing I could have done. And so there's that conflict. And I, I think there's, if, if there's no paradox in something, then I, I don't know if it is truth. To me, there's paradox to all truth. Somewhere, if, you're, if there isn't paradox, you haven't come to the whole truth yet. So I think that they can be both ways true. And when you see that suffering is a selfish state, when you're suffering, you cannot love. You can't let in the suffering of others. You can't come up. So suffering itself is selfish. Not the way we use the word selfish, but literally. Consumed by yourself. So it's... And I, I remember asking my mom as a, as a young person, I was, well, when I was 10 or 11, I remember asking a friend's mother. All of our community were religious, evangelical, Christian people. And I asked a friend's mother, if somebody kills themselves, do they go to hell? And she said, oh, yes, absolutely. So, oh, okay. <laughs> and then a while later, I asked my mom, I thinking, oh, I wonder what my mom will say. So I asked my mom, mom, you know, if somebody kills themselves, will they go to hell? And your answer was, well, if God is loving, then God will see that for some people they can't see a way out. That they can't see a way out. And God will see that and understand that. That was your answer. So it's not yes or no or whatever, but that God must see that. For some people they I can't. Tell anyway, so. Oh, you didn't realize that. <laughs> but it's about seeing, don't ask that kind of question, but see that for some people they can't see. And in addition to not seeing the way through the way out, it can be to not see how that will destroy somebody else. Because you're romancing, you're caught up in all of this and that, and you don't see. And so something like hurt me can here, you know, to be able to see, oh wait a minute, yes, there are other people and how it will affect them. And you've just brought in what you see. You even come yeah. out of yourself just a little bit. Yeah, what well, was my love for other people that got me out yeah. of that way of thinking? Like I suddenly realized, you know what, it's not even an option anymore. Yeah. And so then I had to fight on. I couldn't just let it continue to get me down. I had to fight on because it wasn't no longer an option when I thought about it and just who I would be leaving behind. Well, and that's and like that. Yeah. That, and that's like the scenario of driving the car off the road. Because, uh, as we discussed, uh, my mom and I about that scenario as well, for some people, you know, would you run over your loved ones? Some people would. Mm -hmm. Some people have so much anger and bitterness that their suicide is an act of violence against their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And when I think back to when I was prepared, I loved my family. I loved them all, and I think that that's probably what carried me through. So I can't, like, ugh, like, why does my mom have to be such a good person? I can't, can't do that to her. I resented that I couldn't go because I couldn't do that to her. But still, when I think of that desire to kill myself, and I look at it and I see that it is violence. Suicide is violence. It is the most extreme form of violence. I'll show them. So we also have to face that in ourselves. We think of suicide as being free, living, you know, but we also have to see how very violent we actually are 
when we're suicidal. And seeing that violence, and then tracking that violence back to the anger, tracking that anger back to the experiences and the memories and the expectations we have. For example, I said to my mom, some people, you know, suffer because of, well, maybe their parents don't love them, for example. And she said, well, but even then, I, maybe what it actually is, is that the, their parents' love for them doesn't look like what they expect love to look like. So the problem is the expectation. And the more you look into that, that it's when it's our expectation that is unmet. I expect love to look like this, and it doesn't. And we can say that that means I'm unloved. But what it is, is our expectation that has been misplaced. Your mom's a wise woman. Yeah, she's not bad. She's all right. <laughs> I mean, it can help to name something. It's helpful. If, if it means diagnosing so that you can get the right medication, great. If it's a medical condition and you say, well, this is what it is, then we know what it is and what the treatment is. But usually the way they find out what the treatment is is by trying different things. And then by the treatment that works, you figure out what the illness was kind of thing. So it's a lot like detective work, but for some people there isn't that. You can't point to what it is. And so you have to, that's why for me, even if you can't treat it or treat it fully or treat it forever, you can learn to recognize lies. And if you live 60 years seeing things clearly, your brain functioning in a healthy way, then even if it's hard, like something changed in your brain, it can be hard to figure out why. It can be hard to figure out how to fix that. But what you can do is remember that that is something that's changed in your brain. And you remember that things look different. That has been so helpful for me, is just remembering that sometimes it doesn't look that way. It can be hard to remember what it feels like when things look good. It can be hard to remember all that stuff, but I can remember that it can look different. And the fact that it can means that I can't trust this. This can change. The down can go up, and the up can go down. And that's why I say people, like, a lot of people, you know, like, people sometimes go through life like that, you know, emotionally. And then other people, it's like this. Or, like, you know, and then like that for a while. And that changes person to person. And so to me, the trick is not for all of us to aim to become one of these kinds of people. To me, there's really great gifts in the ones that are like this, because you, you can experience real high highs, and you can go into... There are things that you can see and learn from the lows as well. And if you go deep, you become a deep person too. So there's gifts that come with being one of those. But what you need to do, so not to not be that person, but when you're that person and you're at the high, see, well, see the pattern. There's, life is cyclical. There's pattern always in life. So see that, that that's your pattern. And when you're at that high then, then use it. Use it as well as you can, for as much as you can. Make it good, use it well. And when you're in the low, give yourself that break. And when you're at that high, remember that that doesn't last. Remember it doesn't last. Don't tell yourself, oh good, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy now, I'm better. And my life is gonna be good now for the rest of my life. Know that it doesn't last, so use it as well as you can. And then when you're in the low, know that that doesn't last. The lows always come back up. So hold your breath, get through it, give yourself a break, and then be prepared when the high comes back to use it as well as you can. So ideally, yes, we can just treat these things and get, get a healthy functioning brain again. But even if you can't, you can see what's happening, you can see the truth of it, and you can find a way to use it well. That's the freedom. And so to know with the highs that that is not forever, to know with the lows that it is not forever, um, and that neither of them is necessarily truth either. And to be transparent with other people will enable you to That's seek right. the help when you need it yeah. and to support others when yeah. you're able. And then for other people, because a lot of other people say, like, well, what, you're, you're happy one minute and, you know, whatever. And so people don't understand. But if they understand and see just as clearly as you see, then they'll say, oh, okay. And then be just perhaps a little gentler, a little more patient while you're struggling. And, um, you know, and then also not be disappointed when the high crashes or whatever, you know. And so someone like Robin Williams, I think he was a high and low. I think he was a very high and low. Usually people in the arts are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But think, anytime he would have to go out anywhere or do anything, he'd have to be on. Yeah. If he ever went out anywhere on a low, 
people, he, he might never get a job again, kind of thing, you know, and it would ruin his reputation, the pressure that that has to come with. But if he could have just been free to say, you know what, I'm this way, I'm this. And I don't want to have to be a famous person. I don't want to have to take a picture. I don't want to have to be smiling. I don't want to have to be funny. If he could have had the freedom to just say, screw it, whatever. Then maybe his life could have looked a lot different. And with him, uh, I've heard or read, I don't care. I'm not interested in reading. I'm not interested in judging. I don't care. Uh, I, I'm not here to go and read and study up on Robert Williams or pretend like I know him or anything about him. But I have read that there was alcohol and cocaine involved. And that... I'm not saying to people that you have no right to have a drink or do this or whatever, but if it affects you, you mentally, so if you can only feel good on alcohol or cocaine or things like that, or if you're treating yourself that way, self-medicating, okay, but if you crash the next morning, if mornings are miserable because you wake up on the low of the high that you had the night before, for example, you know, see that that's what it is. So if you're going to self-medicate with things like alcohol or cocaine or things like that, and if it has an impact on you, then see the impact. That's it. Don't trust the low of the morning. Don't kill yourself then because that's how you feel. You know, and you don't want to get caught up in that cycle, but even if you are caught up in the cycle, you can still see that the lows are the crash from the high that you've created in your brain. And so it's just the seeing of it all. That's the power. So you don't trust that low. And that's the other thing about emotions, is they're fickle. Emotions are fickle. We kill ourselves in the darkest emotions. But they don't last. No emotion lasts. No single one lasts. And that's why I think we need love. Because in love can carry through all of the emotions. It is the one that endures. It's not an emotion. It's different. And so I don't trust emotion. I don't trust it. There are signals. There are things to look at. There are indicators of something. So I'll listen to it, pay attention to it. But I don't trust them. The good stuff feels good. It's wonderful and everything. The bad stuff feels awful. And I don't fully trust either. They're all little pieces of truth. And only love can look at the whole big picture and stay steady. The, um the idea, though, of, of a diagnosable um, depression, I understand. But there's also a high rate of suicide, spontaneous suicide. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, break up, young people yep. breaking up, uh, breaking up their marriage. You got it. That is, uh, yeah, we've been spending all this time here talking about suicide as it relates to mental illness, but plenty of suicide is that spontaneous. The girlfriend breaks up with you, or you become totally obsessed over something about your appearance or your body you don't see you're not seeing clearly but a lot of people do i asked somebody i won't say who because the person asked me not to say who if i were to share the story but somebody I, I i asked you know have you ever have you ever been suicidal ever you know she said well one time somebody said that her teeth looked yellow and she, when she was a teenager somebody a friend hey your teeth are kind of yellow and she went into such a depression, locked herself up. She didn't want to live. She wanted to kill herself. She took out a knife and sat there over that. So it's not all mental illness. It's not always that. It can be nothing. Absolutely nothing. So that is a form of mental illness. Yes, it is. So it's, yeah. And, and that distortion of perception. Yeah, but but distortion of perception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so that it's also that, and that is where well, that's why we really have to be talking about these things. So next time somebody's gotten dumped and wants to give it up, picture the yellow teeth thing and realize, my God, she she had her teeth whitened after that and everything, you know. So it really had quite an impact on her life. One passing comment that means nothing. And even if somebody does have yellow teeth, does that mean that they shouldn't be alive? What a ridiculous thing. But to the person. It's everything, and they are prepared to give up their lives a long time. So we have to talk about these things so people can see how ridiculous it is in the end. Oh, the only thing that matters is life, not the color.